Welcome to the Inquisitive Brain Podcast. I'm Shaw, your host. This is a podcast that brings interviews and insights from all walks of life from a bird's eye view on the reality of being. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the podcast. Thank you for joining us today. And if you're new here, we do hope that you stick around. Today, I have the pleasure of speaking with a very talented artist, Stephanie Frizel. Stephanie records under the name of Dylan. She is a very successful Grammy-nominated artist and has been on the Billboard chart for emerging artists. She was nominated for Radio Music Awards and she's appeared in film and television. Stephanie is the creator of the Songwriter Series, which is an online event which offers mentorship for award-winning songwriters and she offers coaching. Stephanie is an author. She's published her first book, Self-Care for the Creative, which discusses self-care strategies for people in creative communities and really supports and champions those artists who are maybe suffering from creative block or who need that extra push. Stephanie has a lot of projects on the go. She has a brand new podcast that's just launched. She has a, a new EP coming out. She has her coaching company. She's also working on her second book, which is absolutely fascinating. And she's producing as well as curating new music. She really is passionate about her work, her art, and about other artists. And she really does have a very interesting, fascinating story to tell. And, uh, you know, how she's come about to help people learn how to self-care, especially creative people. What I really loved about Stephanie is that she's so in tune to... Stephanie's very good at expressing herself. I feel she is. Her words, you know, she thinks about words. She talks about the intention of words, word play and all of that. And, you know, sometimes as a recording artist, you know, to be in the times and to be up on everything, you will use certain phrases and speak a particular way. And there's different areas of creativity that you can express. And that means it's a part of you. It's not really a moniker as such. It's a part of you. They're, all of these personalities are part and parcel of you. Several people have done that in their careers you know really big artists have that sort of different side to them then they can have the artist part they can have the author part the mother part the daughter part the child part all of these parts are a part of us stephanie's very aware of that and because of her insight into being in path she uh, uses and utilizes all things spiritual and all things that are mystical magical and wonderful she's very into crystals you know which people know that i am as well and she's very aware of the energy and how it affects people i absolutely totally enjoyed our interview She's such an open book, very candid about some of her struggles as well with being an empath and also with depression in the early days. And she's, you know, she's utilized and harnessed some of her struggles into writing about them and helping other people to overcome them and to work with them rather than it being a weakness. And again, she does express this very well in the book self-care for the creative. Being a creative person isn't easy. A lot of times people are isolated. It's not like going into a nine to five job. People who are creative, and Stephanie explains this as well, it's almost like you have to create. It's an urge, it's in you, and you're not happy until you're creating. And I think a lot of people struggle with that. So there is the starving artist. I, I believe it's an archetype. So this archetype is very fascinated with their art, just doing their art at any cost. And we find these people all over on the street. They cannot survive in a regular nine to five job. That's just not what they are made of. And these are your musicians, your painters, your sculptors, some of them are people creating all sorts of other things as well. The creativity spans the gambit. It 
is not just confined to something like music. Of course, you can create anything. Inventors are creators. And there's a lot of talk about learning how to harness creativity. You know, Julia Cameron wrote The Artist's Way. So um, and she does have a companion to that as well, like The Artist's Materials or something. I can't remember what it is. But in the end, I believe that just speaking to on this podcast, just speaking to other authors, artists, people who create all the time, you know, comedians, this is within you. It's something within you. And I don't think anybody can make you do it. I think when you're ready, the art will appear. Uh, you may not feel ready and the art will still appear, which means you were ready. You hear a lot of the biggest and greatest, most effective songs, the songs that really get in your soul, get into your soul. A lot of the artists, the writers have said, the songwriters have said, oh, you know, I was just um, daydreaming one day or I was doing the washing up or I was doing something else. I was talking to a friend and the idea came into my mind. I was walking and I don't know if like a writer might do, so, you know, you've got all, all these old images of writers sitting at their desk fingers on the uh, at the ready and just waiting for the words to flow through now that may happen and i'm saying all this because i don't think there's any one way in which art is created and there is this idea that everything that is created has already been created so just depending on your beliefs and it's just something to think about this is what this podcast is all about we present to you the ideas, our ideas, myself and my guests. This podcast is a very much a conversation. It's interviews, yes, but we I do feedback. That's been my feedback. I've been told we'd like to hear what you think about that. So I do chime in now and then. And Stephanie has such a great communication style and it, she's really very self-aware as well and impacts usually are we do talk about her thoughts on empathy and you know we talk about her thoughts on creativity i always ask the question are we born with it do we learn it so a lot of people go to music schools you know but they they may have a little something and then they go into school to perfect it. So maybe to learn how to read music. It doesn't mean you're not an artist. It means that there's a bug or something within you that's been struck. And because I don't think it debilitates you, but there's something that's been struck, a bug that's struck. And you, you feel it, you know it, you're drawn to it. Some people will go for it. And I believe that's where the, your, who you are, your consistency comes in whether you're built for it or not. So some people will go for it at, at all costs. And then some people will go a different way. Perhaps it's too hard, it's too difficult. Perhaps they've got a family to feed. There are many reasons why people don't pursue that path, but it doesn't mean your creativity has to stop. It only means that perhaps you're going to be creating within your own home you maybe you it won't be a public issue public thing maybe it will just be for those you love and for a few i find artistry creativity really fascinating stephanie joins me today to talk about all of that again it's been such a pleasure meeting her she's a fascinating i know you'll find her fascinating and what i found was she's very different from dylan the you know how she records she records as dylan d-y-l-n and she tells us a story about how that came about as well because i ask about that and her music is very different from how she comes across and that's how i see it anyway it'll be interesting to see how you all see it anyway go and get the book it's self-care for the creative i'm still stuck in the 70s and 80s with my music um, and I don't listen to much else. But when I find other artists who I find very interesting, I will listen to them. And of course, you know, other people around me, younger people around me do, you know, I'm almost forced to listen to some of it, which I very conveniently carry headphones. That's why I carry headphones everywhere. But anyway, that's all another story. I'm going to get in trouble for that. So without further ado, let's welcome Stephanie to the show. Stephanie, thank you so much for joining me today. It's lovely to see you. Thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to, to jump in today. 
Now, you've got so many, I suppose, hats in the air. You do so many different things. But I want to start out with your podcast. Congratulations. You've just launched your podcast, which is wonderful. It's called yeah. Self Care for the Creative. Yes. And I want to ask you what inspired you to start a podcast? Sure. So, the podcast is basically the companion to my book, Self Care for the Creative. And Obviously, I wrote the book, but I also wanted to make sure that people that are on podcasts and listening to all kinds of different content to be able to access the materials. So I made sure that I am bringing on create different creatives in different areas um, with different you know creative practices to talk about their creative journeys and their self care, certain struggles that they've had to deal with, such as anxiety, depression, all the things that a creative might go through, um, just to give that audio experience for listeners to and also to you know find the book as well and um, and to provide a way to just give little short snippets of all the techniques and strategies that I love so much about the book. Um, so yeah, it's it's basically the audio companion to my book. Okay, that makes sense, right? Okay. Yeah. Which we're going to talk about your book in a minute, because I think anybody who finishes writing a book, just going through the process, hats off to you. So we're going to come to that. But tell us a little bit about the songwriters series and what yes. people get, what's involved, and who can join. Of course, yes. So the Songwriter Series is a online platform that I created and I curate and I host uh, quarterly. So every few months, I bring in a new round of three different hit songwriters who are all award-winning, top of their field, um, have had lots of cuts with um, amazing songwriters and artists. And it's really just a a platform for anyone to join who is an artist, a songwriter, a music producer, looking to get mentored, get feedback on their music, and to just come to a space where they can ask questions and um, get support and get inspiration and get a breakthrough. Because at least I found that in the music industry, a lot of people tend to kind of keep to their own corners. And there's obviously community um, in different areas. But I, I love the idea that it's online, that anyone can tune in from anywhere, whether you're in Belgium or you know Australia. We've had people come in from Australia um, and they get to see this a curated group of songwriters and every time it's new every time it's different and you get to have a little taste of their expertise and um you know I love it because I encourage people to come with something that they're struggling with um and ask questions about that and be like oh I'm you know I'm struggling about this or I'm you know specific questions so that they can just receive that support and get really loved on and do you find that creative people we're going to delve into the creativity in a minute but do you find that creative people are a little bit more sensitive to feedback what's what's your experience in, with that of course of course I, I feel like I feel like every like creatives are sensitive creatures just in general um it's what makes us so great at what we do with our art and our creations um but at the songwriter series everyone's been really great at just coming in with an open mind and coming in to learn coming in to you know bring what is up for them and be open to receiving ideas and collaborations and new new ways of thinking that they may not have um, previously thought about. So I think that's the best part. Everyone's a really good sport. Like they, you know, they play their music on the call. Um, so that's one thing you get to do at the songwriter series is you submit a song and it might get a chance to be played on the song and, and the songwriters give feedback on those songs. Um, obviously it's a little bit of a vulnerable situation because it's like showing a work in progress, right? To somebody you don't even know. <laughs> but everyone been really excited about that to be able to showcase their work to a hit songwriter because truly when you're first starting out in this industry if you're a new up-and-coming artist or songwriter it's it's pretty impossible to get in the room with a big songwriter like it's just not normal to like you know first jump into this industry and then all of a sudden you're working with you know whoever who who's who's done like a ton of songs um but the songwriter series gives you that access you you you're able to get in the room with those people and play your music in front of them which is pretty cool and they give you that feedback so um yeah everyone's been really receptive to the feedback so far speaking of which you know songwriting you know all creativity is very interesting it's uh, subjective and it's what 
you yes. know, what you're born. Well, I believe people are born. But I, I wonder for you, do you feel that you were born with this particular creative gift? I know you have a few, but, mm -hmm. you know, you're an empath. You, there's a lot. You've got lots of gifts. But what are your thoughts on creativity? Are we born with it or is it something that we work at and learn? That's a great question. I I think possibly both. It just depends on the individual. Like everybody that is in the music industry game, whether you're a songwriter, artist, like most of us will tell you that it's something that we need to do, or we've always felt born to do it or called to do it. And I think that that, I can't say whether or not, you know, genetically that that's a, um, a thing, but I, I do know that most of us that are in this industry are super passionate about it and like we are obsessed with it. And and for that reason alone, I think that when you know something is your calling, it, it just is. Um, but creativity is interesting because, I mean, I came into this field as a you know singer songwriter and I knew that that was an aspect of my life that was always going to be in my life. I did not know that I would end up actually writing books or, you know, starting a podcast or, you know, there's I think creativity can kind of take all types of twists and turns if you let it. Um, and so much of it is around your curiosity. Um, how curious can you get about yourself and the ways that you can become creative? So I think that's really exciting is that whether you're a creative or not, you can always find ways to incorporate different ways of creativity in your life. Never miss a show by clicking the subscribe button right now. Thank you for your support. You make this podcast possible. Now, back to the show. When you were really young, were you the person singing, you know, with a hairbrush in the mirror or were you yeah. songs with your friends? What, what was happening for you early on? Oh, yeah. So it's embarrassing. But like I used to put like skirts on my head and I would like, scan, you know, sing with my mom's karaoke mic and all that stuff. Um, but yeah, no, I, I loved I loved performing from a young age and I also like to think that, well, I mean, it's, you know, not a fun experience, but like my, my parents did divorce when I was quite young and that was traumatic for me. And so I don't think that there's a coincidence that right around the same time I really started singing. So I like, I almost, almost as an escape or a way to find happiness or a way to express myself and, um, so I do think that uh, sometimes creativity or even sensitivity can be born out of sometimes traumatic experiences. That's a really interesting aspect to it all. Yeah. On this show, we've talked about that quite a bit. I've been interested in that. And I, as, as well as being a therapist, I'm also a spiritual medium. So I've interviewed mm -hmm. lots of different people about that kind of thing and what happens. Mm -hmm. and there's a Netflix show called Surviving Death, and I interviewed the guy who was with all the mediums and he said most mediums have had some kind of trauma in their right. life right. mm -hmm. kind of trauma. so that's interesting we need to do more research because i'm yes <laughs> psychology side of me as a scientist so i want yeah. to research. yeah you i think you've touched on something there yes absolutely yeah, so your songwriting, and I've listened, I want to ask you about two things. One, I know you record under the name of Dylan. So how did that come about? Sure. So Dylan, my, well, actually, so let me just backtrack real quick. So I am from Canada originally, and um, I had a whole initial career in Canada when I first started under a completely different name. And when I moved to the States, it was a turning point for me. And I felt called to totally revamp, change my name, start a new project. And so that's when Dylan was born. And Dylan, Dylan, the name comes from a guitar, actually. So when I was 18 or so, I suffered from pretty bad depression. And that's one of the reasons why I wrote this book in the first place is because at the time I just had no, I was really off the rails. Like I, at my lowest, didn't want to be here anymore. I had zero coping skills. I was just starting out in music. I was a young adult, you know, figuring out like who I was in the world. And at the time my main instrument was a guitar and I had 
three different guitars and one was called Dylan. And this guitar, I was told when I bought it, it's made out of carbon fiber. So it's like a really tough material. And I was told when I, when I bought it that like, you know, it's unbreakable, you know, you could drop it on the floor and it won't smash. It won't shatter. It can, you know, weather any storm. And, um, and that guitar was the, the guitar that I used during that time to kind of get myself out of that depression. I remember picking up that guitar, you know, once a day, even I had really bad writer's block at the time. So I wasn't really writing at the time, but it was kind of an anchor for me to kind of get me out of that depression. I would, I remember like just kind of encouraging myself to pick it up once a day for like 10 minutes, even if I didn't write anything, I was like, just, just pick it up, just pick it up, play with it a little bit. That guitar helped me get out of my depression. And I loved keeping the name as the sentiment of who I am as unbreakable, able to weather any storm, you know, just invincible in that way. So I just, uh, yeah, I kept the name for my artist project. That is heartwarming. So yeah, yeah hit the whole deep story. <laughs> no, it's been absolutely fantastic and meaningful. Well, it's something you often talk about. And that is intention when you're t when you talk about songwriting mm -hmm. i've heard you say things like you know what is your intention for this song for these, mm -hmm. for these words right so you know that is in line with what you you practice what you preach you know there was right. an intention there with that which makes it even more powerful when people come to you what do they really want to do are they looking for guidance with their songwriting to unblock some creative blocks sure i think i mean it's different for every person but I do think that one of the common themes when people come to coach with me and work with me is that they want to feel validated in what in their experience that you know they're not the only one that they're seen that they're witnessed they're held um, through what they're going for because you know it can often be a pretty isolating uh, journey as an artist a songwriter or creative of any kind really um, and so I think that's one of the biggest benefits of coaching or coming to any one of my events is that you are amongst other like-minded creatives, you're amongst other driven songwriters and artists, and you really get to be seen and held. And, um, you know, there's people there that relate to what you're going through. And I think the other thing that I bring to the table that's a little bit different is I'm a woman. <laughs> you know, I, I have a nurturing touch, I'm caring, I, you know, Growing up in this industry, it was all everything, everything was run by a man. And, you know, I would have loved to have been part of things that were more female led and, um, you know, just in that kind of different, you know, space and an arena that was just really supportive. Um, so I think, I think people come to coaching because they want to be validated with their experience and they want to know that things are possible for them you know, and that there's always a block somewhere. It's a, it could be a money thing. It could be a, I don't want to put myself out there thing. It could be a, how do I, you know, how do I keep up with social media? There's always some sort of block that um, someone is, is going through. But what's so funny is that usually when we start coaching, I kind of walk them through processes of like how to mastermind and solve each of these problems. And they usually know the answer. They just need someone to mirror it back to them to be like, you know the answer. <laughs> um, and then they're like, oh, you're right. Thank you. I know what to do now, blah, blah, blah. Um, so it's just kind of having that camaraderie. And um, I like to refer to uh, myself as kind of being like your, your co-pilot, your little wing woman, just to kind of, you know, be your number one fan and just hype you up and let you know that you can do it. And I like yeah. what you said about you, you like a wing woman. You're really there yeah. bring them on, championing them. I know that you're an empath. Do you feel that you were always empathetic? I'll just quickly say to the listeners and viewers, some of you may have heard me talk about empathy before. I believe we're, this is my belief, I believe we're born with empathy, but unfortunately, mm -hmm. some people um, miss that little bit. However, we don't know, it's still research. Do you feel that even as a child, you sort of felt that with people? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yes, absolutely. For as long as I can remember, I was very aware of my surroundings, very in tune with people's emotions. And I think um, the divorce that my parents went through definitely impacted me as well. And I, I don't know whether or not I was born with it or if I was born with it and my uh, early experiences neurologically affected me and kind of brought out that 
empathy and sensitivity. It's hard to say. I don't know for sure. I do think I do think that I if I were to guess, I think I was born with it and that um, those early experiences definitely brought that out in me right away. <laughs> um, being hyper in tune with people's emotions for sure. Yeah. Which can, um, you know, begs the question for you, did you find there were challenges being empathetic? You know, empaths can really suffer sometimes. Of um, course, yeah. But, but also has it been a strength and in what way? Yes, yes, absolutely. So, so I didn't actually discover that I was an empath until I was 30. So I love telling the story because basically the majority of my life so far, I had no clue what it was. And it wasn't until I went to my therapist's office and, you know, was having my therapy session. And I was, you know, really at this time um, in the thick of my codependency issues. I was taking on a lot of people's problems and my relationships were really one-sided and I was giving, 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 and people were taking, I had no idea what I was doing. And it's just because I didn't know that I was empathetic and highly sensitive and just prone to want to help and to heal. And, um, I was drained all the time. And then, um, my therapist did say she brought, she was like, have you heard of empaths and highly sensitive people? And I was like, no, what is that? And rocked my socks off total major, uh, aha moment for me, went home, read every book there was on it. <laughs> um, and then I really wished that I had known all this stuff sooner because, it, it all made sense. Like my entire life all of a sudden made sense. I was looking back on very specific moments in my life and how I coped with it then and realized, oh, <laughs> it's because I was empath or I'm an, I'm an empath or, you know, I, I used to, um, you know, feel like odd when I was growing up as a kid or amongst my other friends because I was overthinking a lot. I was feeling very deeply. I wasn't processing things the same way as my peers. So I often felt like something was wrong with me at the time. Um, but knowing what it is now, I'm just like, okay, well, <laughs> this is who I am. And I have so much more self-compassion towards this trait and I understand it better and I honor it and I am so hardcore about my boundaries now and it's what makes me a great creator so I really cherish it a lot. With empaths they often tend to reach out spiritually in a way that connects with the other world shall we say or whatever else mm -hmm. is around us and many names for it um yeah. Jesus, you know everybody out there you may have your own words for it but you know tarot mediumship um healing you know remote healing crystal yes. so where it did it play a part in your journey any of those absolutely yeah so uh, it's funny because well, I consider myself a witch. This is, you know, the last few years, I really went through a pretty awesome spiritual journey around that. But um, throughout my whole life, there were signs that I was like, <laughs> I remember being very small and very drawn to crystals. And <laughs> I remember this one time, my dad took me to like a, a flea market type thing. And I saw an amethyst crystal, it was $10. And I was like dying to have it. And he was just like, no, it was like an immediate no. And um, at, I remember at that point, I kind of pushed it away in my mind, like, oh, rocks are stupid, rocks are silly, whatever. But when I look back at that moment, I'm like, wow, I was already, I was so young, so drawn to crystals. And um, I used to go to the, the local store to buy candles and incense. And, um, you know, my favorite movie was The Craft when I was a kid. You know, so there was all these signs throughout um, my uh, childhood and teenhood and even early adulthood that I was very drawn to the spiritual world. And I just did it didn't click for me, like for the longest time, I just thought it was a hokey, whatever. Um, but then I went through a, a really terrible time, um, a breakup relationship, if you will. And I needed to do some sort of cord cutting um, spell. <laughs> and I really needed to just let go of this one uh, situation and person in particular uh, for my own healing. And I turned to spirituality for my personal healing. And I ended up creating this really epic, iconic, day long ritual and spell around this for my own personal healing. And it wasn't until afterwards that I was like, wait a second, <laughs> I'm a witch. <laughs> like, and 
I was like doing all the, you know, the candles and I was, it was just crazy that like, it didn't even click until afterwards. And then I was like, okay. And then, you know, my spiritual journey kicked off from there. I just like to remind you all to click that like button, wherever you're listening, wherever you're watching on YouTube, leave us a comment. It really does help with the algorithm and to push the podcast forward. If you're listening on Apple, Spotify, or any streaming platform, please do the same. Like the video, share it as well, and leave us a five-star review or any review, whatever you're thinking. Feedback is welcome. Thank you for your support. Wonderful. Yes, I've seen some of your photos of your crystals, and they're fantastic, amazing. Thank you. I have so many. (laughs) Me too. It's so difficult to display them. You have to clean them. You (laughs) put them out in the new moon. It it is so much, you know, crystals need love too. (laughs) Yes. Yeah, of course. To care for them. Um, Okay. So yeah. And some people will have those practices, but not call themselves witches or. Mm -hmm. So everybody has their thing. Yeah. That brings me to your, how you express. Because you 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 are very good, actually. I think just watching some of your videos on Instagram and everything, you're very good at expressing yourself. Very Thank good you. speaker and really good at expressing your thoughts. So I wonder, did that lead to? Did, did you have a sense of that? And did that lead you to writing your book? If not, what led you? Great. To- yeah, I think. You know, it wasn't always like that for me. Like I I can recall being a kid and I remember being very quiet, very shy early on. Um, So this, um, the ability to be, you know, confident and outspoken and just say what's on my mind. It wasn't always like that for me. I, I think, I think I used to have in the past, a lot of fear around saying what's on my mind, really having an opinion and owning my perspective. Um, and I think what's changed is that I just, I think, I think I just love and respect myself differently. And I think that's just my own personal growth and personal journey. So I think as I've, you know, gotten to know myself and understand myself and really just honor and respect everything about me, I think that's just kind of come naturally with the territory. Plus, you know, being a performer and a singer for the majority of my life, I think that's also, um, you know, being used to on stage is, is just like a thing um, that I'm used to. So I think um, I think that's where it comes from. But it's definitely grown and changed. And um, how it's related to the book, I actually think that I actually think that writing the book has helped me uh, express myself more vocally around these subjects as well, just because, you know, I spent a year on it and I really versed myself on all these topics and read a lot of books and, um, you know, put in the research around all this stuff. Um, so I think the process of writing the book has given me more confidence to talk about the subjects as well. There's so much in that. I like that you pointed out it took you a year to to do that. Yeah. (laughs) Also, what you were talking about was, you know, being younger and perhaps not being aware that you had these gifts inside or, I mean, this Mm -hmm. is my interpretation. Yeah. But being a little bit shyer, I suppose. Yes. Yes, I was definitely. Yeah, but isn't it interesting? Some children are very good at just expressing themselves. You know, I'm mm-hmm. first with me, yeah. and no, I'm first, and yeah. I get away, and you know, they're really bossy. And yeah, then, yeah. Some children fall back. I I think it's about personality because you know psychologists believe we're born with personality. Mm-hmm. But I don't know. Sometimes if we grow out of it or it shifts and I think with you that's what's happened it shifted yeah. in a way mm-hmm. that you can now express yourself which brings us to the book because fantastic well done it's out thank there. you a link will be in the show notes thank you tell us about self-care for the creative yes so this is my first book I'm super excited about it and as I mentioned before one of the main reasons why I wrote it was because I did struggle with depression and anxiety a lot when I first started my career as an artist and a songwriter and when I discovered I was an empath it blew my mind wide open and I wished I could go back to the beginning of my career knowing these tools and strategies ahead of time so 
And I also realized that the connection between creatives, empaths, and highly sensitive people hasn't fully been <laughs> drawn in. So I was like, okay, well, these three things are all very related. And what if I could just throw it all in a book for the creative, for an artist, a songwriter, anyone who's in a creative field, so that they have the tools, they have the strategies to live this creative lifestyle. Um, so that's really what the book is about. We cover the basics of self-care. We go over working from home because creatives often work from home. And there's a whole list of things around that that can help empower you. And we go over being your own boss and those tools that you need to make all those decisions yourself because that can be a really big mental struggle as well. And of course, we cover empaths and HSPs. Creatives often are. And that's a whole other category that needs to be addressed because if you don't know what your boundaries are, you might get drained, overwhelmed, exhausted, all of those things. Um, so bringing some awareness around the empath and HSP thing to the creative field, I think is really important. Um, but I think my favorite thing about this book is that at the end of it, there is a design your own self-care toolkit. Um, and that's because everybody's self-care looks different. Um, so I walk everybody through a process of what works for them so that when you're done with the book, <laughs> You have a toolkit and you've already identified the things that work best for you and you have a plan to of how to incorporate them into your daily life. What would people take away besides that toolkit? Because I've seen some of the book and there's really good outlays of what this means, what that means for people just to guide them along. So what else sure. will people gain from, from actually getting a copy of this book? Sure. So one of my... One of the techniques that I created actually is called emotion separation. And this is particularly powerful for empaths uh, who struggle with taking on people's emotional baggage, uh, which is very common in songwriters and artists, especially if you're in songwriting sessions, you have to listen to the other artists, you have to, you're around people all day. So you're constantly absorbing emotions. And emotion separation is the act of separating or differentiating your feelings from the feelings of another person. So this is really powerful because that's one of the biggest struggles that I had was not being able to process what feelings were mine and what feelings were another person. So in three steps, you write down all your feels. That's step one. Write down everything you feel. Could be, you know, uh, your friends, your husbands, whatever. Um, and then step two, you label it. You label it mine or not mine. So you're literally sorting through your emotions and just categorizing, okay, what, you know, this particular emotion 100% is mine. That's not mine. And then step three is to just claim what's yours and release what isn't. So I like to refer to this process as like clothes washing around in the washing machine, right? Like all the clothes are in there and some of it's yours and some of it's not. And um, at the end of the day, you dump out all your clothes and you have to sort through it. And so I like to refer to it as sorting through your emotional laundry. Because there's no school, is there? I mean, there used to be a <laughs> I guess there still is a and R, but record companies, it's all changed. It's all different now. Mm -hmm. So where do artists go? What do they, who guides them, who helps them? It's a great question. Yeah, it's a great question. There's a, there was a whole conversation around how a lot of people think that artist development is dead because record labels don't do it. Even managers don't do it. Your publisher doesn't do it. <laughs> There's no one really you know, um, songwriters actually are probably at the front line. Uh, they don't get paid to do it, but they are at the front line um, guiding those artists and helping them find their sound and, um, you know, holding their hand throughout um, building their projects. So I would, I would definitely credit songwriters as the kings and queens of, you know, artist development. But um, there is a conversation about how artist development is dead. And that's where I want to come in and change that. Um, because everything we do, whether it's the songwriter series, the coaching, the rewrites masterclass in the mix, it's all about developing an artist. Um, so we are alive and well over here with artist development. <laughs> oh, that's so good to know. So let's just do a quick round of questions just off the top of your head. See what's cool. happening in life at the moment. If you could name an old retro band, what would be your favorite one? An old retro band. 
Hmm. I, the first thing that's coming off my m- top of my head is Led Zeppelin. I don't know. There what you does. go. Yes. <laughs> You're left in my Led own Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> top three for me. Okay. <laughs> top three songs in your playlist right now. Oh, that's so, such a good question. Probably every song is probably by Russ. I'm such a big Russ fan. I don't know which songs. The, the top three Russ songs I'm probably listening to right now are Nasty, Star, and Handsomer, probably. Wow. <laughs> Though I listen to all the music, so. <laughs> yeah. I have no idea who that is. But it's I- fine. Yeah, I was, it's very going small, to, underground. <laughs> I was going to your Instagram and I saw a post about him. So yeah. I thought that ch- that you feel changed the very core of you. Yes, I got two. I you are a badass, Jen Sincero, and the artist way, Julia Cameron. Both both of those. Yeah, <laughs> amazing. Not surprised about Julia. Yeah, your go to crystal. Let's say you're running out the door. What would you grab? Oh, that's such a, I love this question. I feel like I could do a whole other episode on crystals. Ooh, I think the first thing that I'm thinking of for some reason is I have this tiny little jet ball. It's about this big and it fits in the palm of my hand. And anytime I'm going to like a social activity, I like to have that on hand because it it makes me feel like I can kind of shield energies and, you know, sort of it can help absorb anything that's going on around me and that it doesn't have to like, you know, penetrate me. Um, So my little jet ball, I think, is my choice. (laughs) Wonderful. Yeah, jet is very grounding as well. Jet doesn't get enough love. So I'm glad you mentioned (laughs) jet. Yeah. (laughs) Excellent. Okay. Last life lesson you've learned the last life lesson this one i think this one's really fresh for me um i've I've been really reframing the way i look at and relate to stress so what i mean by that is i think in the past i had a relationship with stress as almost like a toxic relationship with it like if i was under a certain amount of stress it meant that i was working hard and that meant i was doing good right Um, And I'm reframing my relationship to stress now and kind of looking at it like, well, why? (laughs) Why put myself through, you know, unnecessary amounts of stress? So I've definitely been reframing just the way that I look at it and the way that I relate to it and putting a lot of boundaries around, okay, when is too much and when do I need to go chill out and just really, really loving and honoring and respecting myself when it comes to how much stress I take on. Great. And what I love about that is you're not saying stress is bad. What the world needs less of is... What the world needs less of. Ooh, that's so, so good. I love these questions. It's a whole other podcast episode. (laughs) I I think, I don't know why, but social media keeps coming up in my head right now. And I think... I think the world needs l- l- less distraction or less passive distraction because um, I think a lot of us aren't in control of what we're consuming, whether it's on social media, the news, whatever it is, be more intention in where we put our focus. Because I, I feel like that's very relevant right now is I think the intention span now is like 2.9 seconds or something. It's something ridiculous. Um, and so intentionalizing how you're spending your time <laughs> uh, so I think less less passive distraction uh, and I think a lot of that is social media <laughs> yeah and not that social media is bad I love social media I'm on there all the time and I you know it's an important piece of running a business and you know doing your thing and I, I think that's awesome it's just a matter of again boundaries around what that looks like for you and when is too much yeah. So from this lifetime, you want to invite three people just for a quick coffee. Mm-hmm. Probably got yeah. 45 minutes to an hour because you've got an appointment now. You're going to, you know, to writer's meeting. Okay. Who would you ring up and say, right, um, at Starbucks, come and meet me? I love these questions. Okay, so they have to be alive. Yeah, right? they have to be alive. Okay. <laughs> they have to be alive <laughs> in this <laughs> lifetime. <laughs> okay um you have to be alive three people gosh that's so good well russ for sure Joni mitchell i think would be incredible and okay so i just met her very briefly at her most recent um book launch um dr judith orloff that's a really interesting mix (laughs) dr judith orloff Joni mitchell and russ i don't know (laughs) Excellent. Well, yeah, oh, that would be interesting. I wonder who would yeah. have most of the conversation. <laughs> Probably Russ. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, okay, let's go to the 
passed on one. So from the past, any three people, and you've got more time with them, maybe, you know, a couple of hours, really. Okay, okay. Okay, so they've passed on, gosh, okay, three people. Anthony Bourdain um, would be there for sure. I don't know why, but Van Gogh is coming in my head. <laughs> I don't know why, Van Gogh. My grandma, I never met her, but she she's very... Uh, present in my life, especially uh, recently, for some reason, I've been feeling a very strong spiritual connection to her and I never met her. So my grandma, my mom's side. My mom's side. Okay. Yeah. 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 I believe, I believe she was uh, a healer. Um, and so I think that the spiritual, you know, witchery was definitely there uh, in my bloodline. And I think I, I would relate to her a lot. Um, so I've just been hearing little stories about what she was like and how she'd walk around the house with like a coconut burning stuff, out of, you know, and then she'd like see spirits or whatever. And, you know, I was just like, wow, that's so cool. I had no idea. And so I feel a really strong connection to her, even though I never met her. <laughs> An item that you still have that no longer works. Um, I have this clock that I got at a flea market. I don't think it ever worked, honestly. <laughs> it never worked, but I it's it's a clock that is the it's like from the 70s or 80s or something. It's a very specific style and actually it glows in the dark. Um, and my mom used to have one in her house that I remember. I recall this specific clock that glowed in the dark and I saw it at a flea market and I was like, ah, oh, it was very packed with nostalgia. So I, I bought it, but it, yeah, it never worked. <laughs> it's interesting yeah. how things happen like that. And yeah. lastly, if you could go back to a particular time in space, a decade, an era, anything yeah. stand out? Okay, there's, I have two. <laughs> I have two. One's really weird and out there, but like, I would like to just like, float back into time and just see what dinosaurs were like. <laughs> I wouldn't want to be amongst the dinosaurs, but I just, I am super curious to see what like earth looked like at that point and what the animals were like at that point. Um, but more so, you know, more currently, I think uh, the twenties, I think like a flapper girl kind of vibe, you know, roaring twenties would, would be super fun. And also like no phones were there. It was just, I feel like you were very present and uh, you know, living experiences in that time. And it just seems like a really fun period of time. Let's talk about your music just a bit. I created sure. your music career. You do so many things. So you're coaching, you've got you've got a new EP coming out as well. So tell us a little yeah. bit about, about that. Yeah, so my artist project right now is really just focused around having a lot of fun. Um, I My husband is a producer and um, one of the best things about um, our life and our relationship is we get to make music together all the time. And so so, and it's just really awesome. It's just like such a great piece of our uh, relationship. And um, so I make music all the time. Um, we have a, a home studio here. So I just, whenever I have an idea or I'm inspired, I just hop in there and create. And um, a lot of these songs actually are songs that I did a really long time ago. And they've just been sitting on a hard drive, actually. And, you know, I think this year I just really wanted to just start putting out more stuff and um, have fun with it and just release release the hard drive. So this project has five songs on it and it's all written by me and um, yeah, I'm just having a really, really good time with the project. You seem to have a different persona and I don't know if this is an artist thing. Absolutely, yeah. I'm sitting here now and then as Dylan. So yeah. how, how do they integrate? What happens with yeah. that? Yeah, that's a great question because I also tell my husband often that I'm like, I have so many split personalities. <laughs> like I have so many personalities. But I think, honestly, I think they're all me. It's just, you know, with my Dylan project, I get to express that piece of me explicitly in a different way than I would say coaching. <laughs> you know what I mean? So I don't think they're, you know, um, separate of each other. I think they're all me. It's just... Um, I'm able to really play and have fun uh, through my music and explore different aspects of myself, my, you know, more badass self and, you know, and just really express that piece of me because that's there all the time, but it just gets to come out in a different way. And, um, you know, with coaching and writing in the books and stuff, I think um, that sort of motherly nurturing piece of me and caring for, you know, up and coming people is very, very strong there as well. So I get to 
play in that arena as well. So I think I think it's good to just embrace all sides and it's okay to be a little bit of a Rubik's cube and, <laughs> you know, just be colorful. <laughs> yes. As you say, it's you, it's a part of you and yeah. we're not one dimensional. We may right. many personalities and it's okay to have split ones. The ones that aren't diagnosed. <laughs> Those are the yeah, ones. yeah. 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 And just to touch quickly on the depression part, I used to work um, with a lot of people who suffer from depression. Mm -hmm. And I don't believe people realize how debilitating yes. depression can be. And yes. often they're told, oh, just pull your socks up or, oh, yeah. you know, just watch a film, have a cup of tea in England, have a cup right. of tea. Like that will solve everything. And someone right. once said to me, look, it, it, it's real. I can barely get out of bed. So yeah. I, I don't know if you may have a word for someone who might be suffering from depression perhaps they're an artist as well and that can really be debilitating of course yeah yeah so the yeah i totally get it and when i went through it um my depression was debilitating i didn't go out i didn't see anybody i didn't eat i was barely sleeping if i was sleeping i was sleeping all day i had no reason to get out of bed I looked like a ghost, like I just, and I remember a really uh, distinct brain fog, like it felt like my brain just couldn't connect, like it just wasn't, and my emotions were all over the place, I definitely pulled out a big beat myself up stick all the time, why can't I, why can't I just be good, like what's wrong with me, um, yeah, it, it's, it's debilitating, and I think, um, Really, the thing that worked for me uh, specifically was, and I talk about this in my book, is called the shortlist. Um, and it's three to five small, manageable tasks for you to do every day. So whether it's take a walk, wash your face, uh, write a poem, or pick up your guitar, small, manageable tasks, um, just so that it gives you something to do, something to focus on, some feeling of momentum. Because when you're stuck in that loop, that like playback, like from hell loop, just the same, 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 um, that really, really, it it's disruptive and really hard to deal with. And I think the short list really just gives you that sense of we're moving forward, you know, and that helped me a lot. The book, I mean, I can't recommend it enough. That's amazing. Oh, it's thank you out there like it because you're living it you're you're the artist right. you are in it so right who better to get you know <laughs> what's Thank up you. next for stephanie um i think what's up next is continuing with coaching and building programs that i'm excited about and i already have started a second book <laughs> um so i'll be working on that yeah i don't know when it'll you know i have no deadline or anything yet but um yeah i already got number two cook it <laughs> and especially now that i've done one i i know how to do the second one better you know i know how i know my process now when i first started it was really a colossal task it just felt so daunting to me i had no idea what i was doing and now that I've done it once, I'm like, all right, cool. Number two will be a lot easier. <laughs> Just quickly here about the book as well. And your aesthetic too, because I noticed the book stood out for me because of its aesthetic, the black and the gold. And that mm -hmm. seems to be a part of your aesthetic too. Just behind yeah. you, also yeah. sometimes what you wear as well. <laughs> What does it, what do the colors mean for you? Colors have energy, really. So Yeah, do they do. You. Um, that's a great question. I, I, I love black. I love gold. I love sparkles. I love, um, things that feel magical and mysterious and, um, uh, mystical. Um, and I think, and that's not to say I don't like all colors. I definitely love to wear bright, colorful things uh, sometimes as well. But I think, I don't know, it just gives me a sense of, it feels like regal and powerful and universal to me. And I think that that's, I guess, part of my, brand i don't know <laughs> want it to feel powerful and strong you know um yeah I, I i love gold i've always been obsessed with gold and i i wear it a lot as you can see <laughs> with my jewelry and stuff so i don't know just been drawn to golds and blacks and things like that yeah well it's wonderful and it really is a part of you so it's very striking as well and it mm -hmm. is quite regal, isn't it? Cleopatra and right. Rome and really abundance and riches mm -hmm. and living mm -hmm. well. And 
I can see how you are very spiritually connected to all the elements. Mm -hmm. Speaking of which, what do you do daily to help you maybe stay focused, grounded, centered? I I have a really solid morning routine that I rarely veer away from. Um, Right when I wake up, I meditate. And then I jump straight into my gratitude journal and my morning pages. So right upon waking, I'm meditating and I'm writing. So those are way, those are anchors for me to help me feel grounded and centered and um, sort of, you know, it's a space for me to like sort through my thoughts or set intentions for the day. And so that, that, those two elements are really key for me. And, um, you know, setting, setting a lot of alone time for myself as well. Um, but I, I'm so sensory. Like I love my sprays. I love my oils. I love my crystals. I, I'm touching things all and moving things around. And, um, yeah, anytime you do a songwriting session, I'm like pulling out all the crystals and the, the incense and pulling tarot cards. And yeah, and I just, I love, I love, uh, the sensoriness of playing with, with all my metaphysical stuff. Well, Stephanie, thank you so much. This has been fascinating just to learn more about you, about your music, about thank your, you. your book, about all the things that you offer creatives. We call them creatives, people who create. Yeah. Anyone, as you said at the beginning yes. of the show, could join in and be inspired, I believe. Absolutely, yeah. yeah it's definitely applicable to any creative field. Um, or if you're not, if you're, if you don't consider yourself creative, um, let's say, cause empaths can be in, you know, uh, medical fields, you know, they could be in really high stress medical fields and creativity could be a great thing for you, um, to help balance that. Um, so I don't, I, even though it is for creatives, I like to leave it open to empaths and, and HSBs and incorporating creativity in their self-care. And if people want to join in, I know you your last one started on in April, the end of April. So, so when's the next intake? The next is July. So the next songwriter series will be in July. Yeah. But they can find out all the information from your website. Oh, yes. They can join the waitlist now. Yeah. You can sign up and, and put your name down and we'll, we'll send you an email right away. Yeah. Perfect. But also follow you on social media because no doubt you'll be posting and saying when things are happening so they could yes. do that as well. Yes. Yes, of course. I'm uh, I'm Stephanie Freizel, Steph with an F and then an I, <laughs> Freizel. And I'm on Instagram, TikTok, all of the social media platforms. Perfect. Perfect. Stephanie, you're an amazing person. Uh, your Aww. energy is just fantastic to speak with Aww. thank you so much so fun and i just i had i had such a great time this was this was a great conversation i appreciate it thank you for joining me today be sure to like subscribe and comment and share the video on your favorite podcast platform you can also follow on your favorite social media platform see you soon